On this day, in 1927, all appeared to be well and good within the Brisbane CBD. Throughout the morning, local workers went about their daily business, traversing the city's busy streets on the commute to their respective workplaces. Mothers and children moved between the various street-facing shops and merchants, purchasing goods for their households and enjoying the sights. In Elizabeth Street, one of the main thoroughfares through the CBD, all appeared as it had done on any other day until the unmistakable crack of two gunshots echoed out above the familiar hum of the street, and for a moment the pedestrian throng came to a very abrupt and nervous halt. For some days leading up to the fateful event, not all had been well at a block of residences on Brunswick Street in New Farm. Modest tenancies, trouble had been brewing back and forward between two adjoining dwellings involving the love troubles of Stanley Morin and Lydia Henry. The couple, who had met a year earlier in 1926, had been through some major ups and downs regards their subsequent relationship, breaking up and making up multiple times. Morin, a labourer and doorman at the local gambling school, was known to be excitable and had lived a very colourful existence over the previous 10 years. Despite his claims of being in the labouring profession, he considered himself more of a professional gambler and it was rumoured that his income was garnered through slightly more nefarious and precarious means. His muse, Lydia Henry, had lived an even more colourful existence throughout her life. Originally a citizen of South Africa, Lydia had married a man by the name of Otto Drensik, a union that was destined to fail after four short months. Transferring her affections to an Australian expatriate named Colin McVinish, Lydia convinced her new love to facilitate passage for her two children to Australia on his return home in 1914. Settling in Rockhampton, the couple lived as husband and wife through until 1925 when Lydia took ill and was advised by her doctor to move south to Brisbane on account of the climatic conditions. Colin agreed to cover the cost of Lydia's rent and living expenses whilst in Brisbane and made regular visits to ensure her health was progressing. However, after a year of separation, McVinish discovered that Lydia had taken a number of lovers whilst residing in the southern city and promptly terminated their relationship and her funding. It was at this exact time in 1926 that Lydia met Stanley Morin. However, her proclivity for taking multiple lovers took its toll on their relationship also, finally coming to an ugly head in April of 1927. Having split up yet again, with Lydia moving back in with her daughter at Blackhall House in George Street, Stanley was incensed on realising that she'd relieved him of his remaining £10, leaving him with no other option but to pawn his suitcase and coat to afford food. Confronting the mother and daughter over the alleged theft, Stanley declared that you will go for a long sleep under the soil. I might as well be behind the grey walls as be without you. Turned away and still fuming at the audacity of his lover, Stanley returned home to New Farm where a fiendish plot was formulated throughout the night. On the morning of the 21st of April, Morin rose early as he was determined to see his dastardly plan through to fruition. Sliding a small automatic pistol into his trouser pocket, which he'd recently purchased from a pawn shop for self-defense whilst attending Brisbane seedy gambling establishments, Stanley slipped away from his abode at 6am. Running into Deborah Gannon, the residential's landlady, on his way from the property, Morin mentioned that Lydia had left him yet again and made the startling admission that he was on his way to seek revenge. Visiting Joseph Bowman's gunsmith's shop in Albert Street, Morin purchased a box of .25 caliber cartridges, finally rounding out everything he'd require to follow through with his ruse. Moving about the pedestrians on the city streets in search of his intended target, he finally spied Lydia walking with her daughter and granddaughter along Elizabeth Street at 11am. Moving through the pedestrians to reach the women in line with the business of Barry and Roberts, where the Maya Centre now exists, 
Morin withdrew his pistol without warning and fired two shots in quick succession. The first bullet barely missed Lydia, grazing her cheek as it whistled down the footpath in between the morning's unsuspecting commuters. However, the second one found its mark, striking the unfortunate woman in the chest right above her heart. In the confusion and panic that ensued, Lydia fled into Corbett's hairdressing salon, where she managed to assert that she'd just been shot before gasping her last breath and collapsing face first to the floor. Reginald Leaves, who'd witnessed the shooting out in Elizabeth Street, quickly hailed a nearby policeman and the two gave chase, catching up to Morin in George Street as he passed the Paris Cafe. He was immediately grabbed, weapon confiscated and placed under arrest for murder. The ensuing case before the court was a sensational affair given the brazenness of the crime in such a public space. Over the course of the trial, the residents of Brisbane were kept on the edge of their seats with each additional report run via the city's newspapers, detailing bizarre statements made by Morin when taken to view Lydia's body at the Brisbane morgue on William Street beneath the Victoria Bridge, and the additional discovery of a bottle of strychnine in the man's room that he'd planned to consume after shooting his lover. Despite continued protestations that he'd not intended to kill Lydia, despite firing on her from less than three feet distant, Justice Woolcock and the jury were not convinced. As a result of his crime, Moran was convicted of willful murder and was sentenced to imprisonment with hard labour for life. <laughs>